Tara Eisen est une écrivaine américaine. Elle est originaire de l'État de Californie et vit aujourd'hui dans l'État d'Arizona où elle enseigne l'écriture littéraire, creative writing, à l'Université d'État. Elle est l'auteur de quatre romans, d'un recueil d'essais et d'un recueil de nouvelles. Ces nouvelles ont souvent exploré le thème de l'addiction, que ce soit littéralement à une substance ou à un autre type comme le besoin viscéral de validation, l'addiction au pouvoir, au sexe, à l'amour. Elle examine également les dynamiques dysfonctionnelles dans les rapports de pouvoir entre amis, entre amants, membres d'une famille. Son nouveau recueil de nouvelles s'inspire cette fois-ci des récits qu'on trouve dans le folklore, dans les légendes, dans les classiques de la littérature de différentes cultures. Tara Eisen dit qu'elle cherche à déconstruire des récits familiers afin d'éclairer d'un regard neuf, d'un regard contemporain, l'expérience humaine. Le dernier roman de Tara, « At the hour between dog and wolf », raconte l'histoire d'une jeune fille juive vivant dans la clandestinité, se faisant passer pour une orpheline catholique pendant la Seconde Guerre mondiale dans la France de Vichy, pour tenter de survivre au cauchemar de la guerre. Elle finit par se perdre dans les mensonges de cette identité, se transformant en catholique fervente, en antisémite convaincue et adepte du fascisme. L'intérêt de Tara Eisen dans cette histoire est de comprendre comment une telle trajectoire psychologique peut se produire. Récemment sélectionné par la rédaction du New York Times, ce roman résonne de manière particulière, face à l'actualité et à la résurgence des idéologies extrémistes dans le monde d'aujourd'hui. J'ajouterai que Tara Eisen a reçu de nombreuses distinctions et prix, dont deux Artists Fellowship in Prose from the United States National Endowment for the Arts et le prix Penn Southwest Award for Creative Nonfiction. Tara. Bonsoir à tous. Um, thank you for being here tonight. Um, thank you so much to Sophie and everyone at Chateau de Lavigny for everything that you do for us and for writers. Um, it's been a privilege to be here. I've especially loved meeting my um, fellow residents and learning more about your work. Um, you guys are awesome. <laughs> so, um, so I am going to read from my most recent novel, which is called At the Hour Between Dog and Wolf. The story was inspired by my stepmother, who was a hidden child in World War II Czechoslovakia. She was a little five-year-old Jewish girl. Uh, her mother sent her to live on a farm with a Catholic family, and she was given a new name and taught the Catholic prayers and told, don't ever talk to the police. She doesn't remember much about the experience. She was only five but she does remember very clearly being told, don't ever, ever cry. And I've known my stepmother since I was a child. She is now in her 80s, and I have never once seen her cry. So that kind of trauma uh, runs very deep, I think. Uh, my novel is not her story. I decided to set my novel in World War II France, and my main character is a 12-year-old girl Uh, named Danielle. She is living a very comfortable life with her Jewish parents in Paris. Her father is a professor, and in the early days of the German occupation of the city, her father is killed on the street when he stands up to German soldiers. And so her mother gets her on a train and takes her out to the countryside to live with a Catholic family who had agreed to take her in. And she is has to pass herself off as a uh, Catholic family member. And again, she is given a new name, she is taught the Catholic prayers, and she is told if she ever makes a mistake, the police will come kill everybody. So she is terrified and traumatized, and over the years she gets lost in this false identity. And has Sophie, as Sophia said, she um, gradually becomes a devout Catholic, but also by the end of the war, several years later, she has become of, of an anti-Semitic disciple of fascism. Mm -hmm. So the novel really looks at how that kind of psychological trajectory can happen. So I am going to read 
from early in the novel, I also want to note there are some anti-German sentiments expressed, uh, but we are in World War II France. So. Um, so this is early in the book, and Danielle, the main character, is looking back on the early days of the occupation. <clears throat> Before the Germans marched into Paris last June, everyone acted like the end of the world was on its way, marching across the map. They'd marched all the way up into Denmark and Norway, across to Belgium and right into France, sneaking in through the unlocked back door, sweeping through the Maginot Line like brushing off strands of spider silk, slaughtering as they went, our brave men butchered, our women and children chopped to bits. Danielle heard the terrible stories everywhere, people babbling in the cafes, the shops, the cinema lines about what horrors were coming next. Get ready for war. They say it's marching toward us, blood and death marching, the end of our ways, of our pride, our honor, our France, of everything we know. Can't you feel it, the coming end? And she could feel it, the end of everything coming at her sneaking inside her room at night to pound her chest and beat blood in her fingertips and ears when she tried to sleep, hoping the lace curtains and satin coverlet would shield her, hide her, keep the dangerous, butchering thing out. Maybe she should say a prayer the way her grandparents always told her to. Please, God, she mumbled into her pillow. Please, God, please. But she wasn't sure which words came next. Anyway, it wasn't nice to pray only when you wanted to ask for something. That isn't why God is there, her father always said. People sewed newspapers into curtains for the coming blackouts, dyed, dried fresh plums into prunes, dug out, dug out old gas masks from the Great War for the looming bombs. Urinate on a handkerchief when the gas comes, hold it to your face. They say it kills the burn. Save up your butter, you'll need it to soothe blistered skin. Everyone said the Nazis were barbarians, dirty Huns, salbush, and they would beat everyone up and steal and kill. Yes, they are inhuman. No superhuman they must be to have beaten us this way, godlike in their Herculean strength, striding whole-limbed and golden across our fields, conquering without sweat. And the British troops, our allies, our friends, fleeing Dunkirk while our own French soldiers were left bleeding into the sand and sea. Danielle saw people running away then, running with stunned, stupefied faces, big suitcases and paintings and boxes of books, mattresses on their backs, dragging children by the hand, hurry, hide, flee. Officials dumped files into the Seine and burned papers in huge bonfires that sent black smoke blooming overhead for days and into her nose and throat and made the whole city smell like singe. Oil depots were exploded to keep them from German hands, and their oily flames streaked the sky in hot oranges and blacks. And shouldn't she and her parents be running away too, she thought, hurrying and hiding from the knives and guns and burning flesh? She worried which of her blouses and shoes she might carry away, which favorite books. She saw a spotty brown dog roaming their streets all day, yelping, and talked her mother into letting her give the dog a plate of scraps. But then there were more dogs, all the dogs people couldn't take away with them in the exodus, yelping in the streets, then turning on each other with howls and snapping bloody jaws. And her mother told Danielle to leave them alone. They'd gone wild from hunger. They would just have to fend for themselves. Most of their neighbors fled, and their maid Sophie went home to Geneva. And her parents' friends, who used to come on Shabbat to argue about God and art, who was or was not betraying France, and whether the war was real or just rumor and threat, a rôle de guerre, a phony war. Her mother sent Danielle to bed early on those Friday nights, <clears throat> when the arguments were less about French politics and God, and more about Poland and ghettos, and the Nazi man in charge of Germany, Hitler. But Danielle listened at the door. You're blind, Paul, she heard them say to her father. Jews and the academics, it's who they always come for first, Jews and academics. But this is our home, her father said. This is our country. We're not running away. And she lay in bed, blood pounding. Are they coming? Would there be blood in gutters? Would the poison gas burn through her curtains to blister her lungs and shred her skin? Rolling tanks crushing those wild dog in the streets. And shouldn't they flee? 
But no, her father wanted to stay. And surely he would shield her, keep them all safe. <coughs> of course he would, yes. And she waited, still, for the end of everything to come get them, like everyone said. The whispers of neighbors and friends, they say Hitler has invaded Britain. They say the United States has attacked Germany. The Pope has committed suicide. The Germans are planning to burn <coughs> Paris to the ground, they say, they say. Our leaders have been taken prisoner, they say, have been tortured and killed. No, they've all fled to North Africa, to Bordeaux, no. They're fleeing further east, to Vichy. The invaders are marching thousands of our men back into Germany, they say, guns pointed at their heads. <coughs> they say German soldiers are cutting off the hands of French boys so they can't grow up to fight. Sold German soldiers use French citizens as human shields when they attack. They say German, sh German soldiers smear their excrement on our precious works of art. I'm actually going to jump ahead a few pages in the novel um, where she d describes that after the Germans actually arrived, things seem to go back to normal for a little while, at least. Uh, and she says, yes, she could still have long walks with her papa, just like always, the two of them together, walking on slow Sunday afternoons until the sun began its drop, and they'd stop on the Pont Neuf to watch the candles and, tr and lamplights twinkle on in the buildings. Watch the colors change, Danielle, he'd say, pointing to the sky. Look how beautiful it is. Look at all the shadings, always changing, from silvery lemon over there to that deep sapphire. Look how it's turning to ink. It's like a painting. We're entre chien et loup at this hour. Now look carefully, and you show me the moment when day changes to night, when the light turns to dark. Can you see it? And she'd look and look, but could never see exactly when the shift happened, when the dog became the wolf. And that didn't change, the twilight sky, just because the Germans were there. Occupation, she thought, well, it isn't so bad. Um, and of course, it gets a lot worse. Um, thank you very much.